Welcome to Grand Rounds today. On a, lo on a lovely spring day, we're, I'm, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brent Nelson. He's one of our fourth year residents in our training program, and we're thrilled to be able to announce that he'll be joining us on faculty next year, starting July 1st. Uh, he will no longer be a trainee, but one of our faculty members. So we're absolutely thrilled about that, given his truly impressive academic career up to this point. It's really an honor for us to um, have him join us as a colleague now. And uh, one, one of Brent's um, most unique gifts, in addition to the many, uh, all the research he's done and all the leadership he's done on a national level as an APA fellow, um, is really translating difficult concepts related to physics, software, mathematics, into a, terms that even I can understand. And so I've just been really, really, really impressed by that over the years. He's a very gifted teacher, and so it's our privilege today to hear from him about TMS in a way that we probably will be able to understand, which is pretty remarkable. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thanks for uh, having given me this opportunity to talk about TMS. It's a really, really broad topic that I hope to give everybody um, some useful information on and um, talk a little bit about our initial clinical experiences as we now have a, a, a clinical program going. Um, so objectives for today. I want to talk about a lot of stuff. Historical development, physics, because physics are fun, function of TMS, um, and then also talk about efficacy of TMS in the treatment of depression. Um, and then talk about some of the, the clinical history and diagnoses required to be a good candidate um, for treatment with TMS. Disclosures. Talking about prescription meds and FDA-approved neuromodulation procedures and devices, we're not talking about any off-label uh, use. Uh, that's a whole nother world uh, for a whole nother talk. So we're going to uh, stick strictly to the, the labeled indications. I don't have any financial interests in neuromod companies or products discussed today. So neuromodulation, everybody keeps throwing around this word. Uh, MinDrive's using it, you know, it's, it's, it's been around a long time. It's used in a lot of different areas. So I was trying to figure out, like, what's the definition of neuromodulation? <clears throat> and so the International Neuromodulation Society says it's a broad array of treatments, both electrical and chemical, targeting a variety of locations in the body to best achieve the desired outcome. Wow, that's, that's a broad, vague definition. <laughs> so really, neuromodulation is a lot of things to a lot of people. When you guys hear neuromodulation, what do you think? What comes to mind? Throw it out there. TMS. TMS, right. That's why we're here today, right? What else? ECT. Yep. What else? Yes, DBS. What else? Broader. Let's think broader. Psychotherapy, absolutely. Fits, fits in the definition, right? Yep. What else? Psychopharm. What about other stuff? Exercise, acupuncture, yoga, massage, nutrition. It's all neuromodulation. If you're affecting the nervous system, you're doing neuromodulation. So we got to get specific in what we're talking about. Um, and in, in the case today, we're really talking about brain stimulation. Um, and that's even a really broad term. So whenever you hear people are talking about these things, just ask them specifically, what, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about brain stimulation. When someone says that, what could that possibly mean? Gosh, it can mean a lot of things. Um, and it's really progressing rapidly. So this is sort of the uh, matrix of acronym DEATH. There is just a bazillion things on here. I think the, the important piece to, to consider um, is really sort of two camps. Conductive versus inductive. We're going to talk about what that means um, in gory detail as far as inductive is concerned. But conductive is really just directly um, putting energy somewhere using direct current, alternating current. There's a whole bunch of different um, options all the way to ECT. You can also think of it in terms of energy. So low energy to high energy. So something like... Uh, like a trigenital nerve stimulator or transcranial electrical stimulator, going to be really low energy, 2 millivolts, 2 milliamps, all the way up to ECT, which is going to be a lot higher energy. You also then have, under the conductive approaches, surgical and non-surgical. We have heard some of these terms thrown out. Deep brain stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, 
Um, it's helpful to know, like, are you actually implanting something in the body, or is it outside the body and it's transmitting energy? On the other side are the inductive approaches. That's where TMS falls. So it's actually using magnets to encourage energy in the nervous system. And we're going to talk at length what that means. So if you can really frame the discussion around low energy, high energy, conductive, inductive, surgical, non-surgical, it's helpful to just kind of know what giant camp of technology and um, clinical uh, approvals you're talking about. Because actually, you can see the little stars here are showing where there are actually FDA-approved um, diagnoses uh, for those particular technologies or procedures. And all the other ones are, are investigational. We're not going to go into those. So a little bit of physics. Guy named Faraday, really cool physicist, back in the 1800s, came up with this idea of induction. Is anybody familiar with induction? What's induction? Yes, exactly. So Faraday noticed this occurring back in 1831, and he was able to describe it. And he, they used this little experiment where he hooks up a battery to a, a piece of wire that then gets wrapped around another loop. So this is, uh, this is actually just an iron coil. And then on the other side, takes a wire, wraps it around, and hooks it up to an ammeter. And is able to show that as you, if you add energy and remove it, and you add energy and remove it to this loop of wire, let's see, I'm going to use a pointer instead so they can keep me. Uh... All right, which one is the, there we go. Um, so what's happening is you're actually getting magnetism being induced in this core iron circle, which is then inducing electricity to flow in this loop of wire. And it's not that there's electricity jumping across. If you touched that, you would not feel a shock. It's purely magnets. If you put a paper clip there, the magnet would, would get attracted, and then it would fall off, and it would get attracted, and it would fall off. And the key is that it's getting turned on and off, on and off, on and off. If you just turn it on, then it disappears. So it's not a static field. It's actually a changing magnetic field is inducing electricity to flow. If you really, really like physics, then you can talk about the changing magnetic field over time is proportional to the electromotive force, and there's a bunch of complex 3D rotational matrix algebra you can do, and it gets, it gets on a, um, um, highly complex really fast, and then everybody gets bored. So the key, though, is... Faraday discovered it, he described it, but he only described it qualitatively. So everybody just basically ignored him in the mathematical literature because they're like, ah, you need, to, you need equations. If you don't have equations, we're not going to accept it. So then James Clerk Maxwell came around in the 1860s, so about 30 years later, put together the Maxwell equations, which that's, this is the, 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 um, the, the Maxwell-Faraday equation, and then all of a sudden everybody started to believe it. So then um, later, again, in the later 18, uh, 1800s, you get this guy, Darsenaval, in, in France, who's actually a physicist and uh, a medical doctor, who starts um, getting excited about this particular type of technology. And he takes and sets up a magnetic coil, uh, 110 volts, 30 amps. And if we remember, a, a typical um, household electrical socket is about 15 amps. Um, and he puts... 42 hertz, so 42 times a second, he adds the energy and takes it away in this machine. Well, what's he think that would be cool? Let's stick it up against somebody's head and see what happens. Well, all sorts of stuff happened. They got dizzy. They were seeing uh, phosphine, so they're seeing like flashes of light that actually aren't there, um, and eventually they just tipped over. Um, it's like, wow, this is, this is like doing something tremendous. Don't know what, but it's kind of neat. Um, and then a, a little bit later, this other guy, um, Sylvanus P. Thompson, in England, decides to put together another machine. And they're all terrifying machines. They look like this, where there's like giant capacitors and huge loops of wire. And somehow they can convince people to stick their head in this thing. And they get just really incredible experiences all the way to complete syncope. Um, so it's exciting that people are asking the question, noticing, noticing the, the physical phenomenon, and asking the question, is there some way that this can affect um, the nervous system? So then let's fast forward. So here we were talking about the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. 
We're going to fast forward, though, to modern developments. And the reason I use quotation marks is these guys are not necessarily, I think, modern by anybody's description at this point. But really, um, this is kind of uh, the next great stage of development. So you have about 40, 50 years where things were sort of just running along. People were investigating induction as, a, as, a, as an option, an opportunity, mathematical principles even some of the neurophysiological stuff, but not much is happening until really 1959, where Colin and all, they went and they used the same magnetic induction theory to actually get muscle contractions in frogs. Like, wow, look at now we're, we're, we're going after something very specific that we can measure in an animal model. Well, then in 65, uh, Bigford and Fenning, they are able to stimulate human peripheral nerves versus, uh, via a pulse magnetic field. And then in 76, Anthony Barker, this is the guy. He's considered kind of the, the, the grandfather of the modern devices. He developed the first pulsing device, and he starts to do it in human muscle contractions. So again, they're like, ooh, we're not quite ready to just like stick it on somebody's head because that's kind of scary, but let's try, let's try on the periphery and see if we can just get muscles to, to twitch and to, to move and, and to say something interesting about that. So in the process, uh, another guy, this Paulson, developed uh, an EMG, which is basically an electrode that you could put in a muscle and you can quantify how much um, activation you're getting out of that muscle. So they sort of start to close the loop. He's like, well, I, Barker says, I can stimulate. Polson says, I can record. Well, let's put them together into something called a Sheffield magnet. This is the first modern TMS device. So you can see there's a stimulator. There's a measurement device, so you can see how much energy is there. There's also EMGs that you can plug it into. And then he has the first coil that's really been developed, that's handheld, it's a donut coil, and it's literally that same thing where it's just a big loop of iron with a bunch of magnetic windings around it that runs down to the stimulator. Um, and so Barker starts, he, he was actually here a couple of years ago at the Neuromod conference, and he said, you know, I started hauling this thing all over the world trying to show people that I could make twitches happen, I could make people do weird stuff, um, all without direct current, actually just using magnets as well, tolerated and, and exciting, and now we need to find something to, to use it for. So let's pause for a second and just talk about this actual device, which I call induction in action. So the, the idea behind it, again, we're talking about a, a rapidly changing electrical current that's producing a magnetic field that then is producing electrical current. So that was the overarching idea, right? The actual device itself is pretty darn simple. Um, it's, you could technically make a really weak one um, with just a few different parts. But the, the key to know is you basically have a huge, huge power supply. You have a way to store that energy from the power supply. And then you have a coil and then you have a quick way to discharge that power, that power storage over and over and over and over again. That's, that's it. Everything else is really just um, in support of cooling or controlling the current. Now, if you do that, if you take that coil and you um, place it on the brain, for example, then you're going you're gonna to actually generate, again, that electrical current here. You're going to generate a magnetic field across, and you're going to generate electricity in the cortex. We'll, we'll show a little bit more detail on that as we go forward. So the exciting part of what Barker did is he made a device that was portable, it was reliable, and then um, they also then had the EMG that they could combine it with. So what they started to do is they started to, gen uh, to build experiments where they could really map out the connectivity of the brain with the rest of the body. And the reason that they went after this first is it's pretty darn easy to me measure a muscle twitch. You know, I mean, you need something that you can get some objective data around, and they had a way to do that with this, this EMG. They were able to generate what's called a motor-evoked potential. And so what they did is they went back to our creepy-looking homunculus where they were able to think about the way that the brain is organized with respect to the motor system, and they were able to start um, probing in a very focused way different areas of the homunculus and then measure that empirically with the level of a motor evoked potential that's generated. Um, and they were able to do that over and over and over again. So what they would do is they would set up, sit somebody in a chair, they would put the coil on their head, they would generate a, a single quick pulse, which would inject a tiny little bit of energy to flow or encourage a tiny little bit of energy to flow in the cortex, which then would run itself all the way down to APB. APB is something you'll hear over and over and over again in TMS literature. What's APB? Anybody know? Think hand. 
go back to anatomy in medical school. APB is a muscle that stands for, I'm hearing whispers, let me just shout it out. Abductor pollicius brevis, yes, yes, anatomy. <laughs> the beauty of APB, good, good job, Dr. Jasper. So APB is a really nice, reliable spot that we can find on everybody, just about. Most people have an APB, and we can stick sensors on it very easily. They're little sticky uh, sensors, and then we put a reference electrode. So it's not like it hurts. Um, you don't have to stick a needle in or anything like that. Um, and it's big enough to detect, and it's fairly the same size on people. I guess unless there's some sort of like uh, world's strongest hand person or something like that, it's going to generally be sort of within the, the norms. Um, and we're able to measure it, and most people, you give them a single pulse, they're going to have a little APB twitch if you're in the right place. So what it gives you is, it, again, gives you this really neat tool to really investigate what's going on all the way from the cortex all the way down to, to someone's hand, which is a, a pretty profound thing. Now, what happens is then in the late 80s, uh, Shugo Ueno, who was just here um, at the Neuromod conference, was a really great speaker, um, he says, well, this donut coil is really um, not very precise. You're getting a whole bunch of cortex. You're getting twitches all over the place when you're, when you're giving people the single pulse. I wonder if we can do better from a coil perspective. Um, and so he develops what's called the figure eight coil. The neat bit about the figure eight coil is it's really just two loops, so we can still get our heads around it. Um, but what he did is he ran the energy in opposite directions, which allows you then to shape the field that's being applied to the cortex and really focus where the stimulation is occurring um, in, the, in the surface of the brain. So this, this revolutionizes the ability to do much more focused experiments, to really dial in on that APB or other areas. You know, you can, I mean, ultimately you can pick whatever, um, whatever muscle you want to go after. Um, you can even go back and, and stimulate the occipital cortex and give people phosphines. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that this can be uh, manipulated experimentally. Uh, but it really uh, opened up the, the flexibility. And then Alvaro Pascual Leon, then in 1991, takes a figure eight coil and goes, huh, I wonder what can happen if instead of doing single pulses, if we start running a bunch of pulses into someone's head. I mean, if you could do one, why not do a bunch, right? See what happens. Well, what he found out is that um, in healthy people, you can take a figure eight coil, run a bunch of pulses into them, and you can actually arrest their speech mid-sentence. It's pretty wild, you know, it's quite the parlor trick. Um, but really saying something profound about um, the way to interact with the brain, non-surgically, um, in a way that doesn't hurt. And near as they could tell, over the hundred odd years people have been doing this, there wasn't a profound amount of damage or, or, or bad effects of, of, of doing these sorts of studies. Um, but the, the profound thing about uh, Pascual Leon was he develops something called RTMS in the process, which is the repetitive TMS. Um, that's really just shaped, um, is really shaped the, the field going forward. So the idea behind repetitive TMS, again, instead of just doing a single pulse and getting a little APB twitch, what you do is you do these trains, they're called. And a train is literally just a, a bunch of stimuli stacked together. And then you give someone a little bit of time to rest, and then you can give them another train. Well, this idea of trains really has since permeated the, the entire field, um, and everybody now starts to talk about um, what types of trains to use, because there are parameters that you can vary uh, in interesting ways. So one parameter people talk about is the frequency. So how fast you deliver these pulses within a train is actually going to determine whether that, that set of stimuli are going to be stimulatory or inhibitory. And so the slow frequency, less than 10 hertz, which is a little bit of an arbitrary number, but less than 10 hertz in a train is going to generally be inhibitory to that area of the brain. Uh, the the uh, higher frequency, greater than 10 hertz, are generally going to be stimulatory. Um, and there's, a, again, a whole series of, of experiments in the research literature that um, are sort of using that stimulatory versus an inhibitory uh, phenomenon in order to um, just probe the nervous system, understand how the brain works, figure out how, um, how neural networks are working together. But clinically, um, what happened was people have trains, they have a pretty safe device, they, have, um, they know it can impact speech. So 
can it be used actually for something clinically? Well, 95, Kolbinger, um, they tried this first proof of concept study going after depression. They thought, well, people who are depressed, they look kind of like, ooh, you know, they're vegetative, their psychomotor slow, their mood is down, everything is just kind of down. What if we can ramp it up and we know we can, we can stimulate people's brains, so maybe that, that will help. Well, they went, um, because the circular coil had been around a long time, they had, you know, Barker had a machine, there were a couple other vendors that had provided um, similar machines, they, they tried it and they found some really encouraging initial results. Well, at the same time, a um, bunch of companies were coming on board, one being this MagStim based out of the UK. Um, they're building lots of coils and people are trying things out. There, um, there was a whole series of experiments uh, in the world of epilepsy where they were trying to actually reduce um, seizure occurrence by using TMS. Bunch of different uh, in endeavors. Well, the TMS society and a lot of people um, nationally are like, all right, it's time to get, some, to, to get something around safety here because there's not been nearly enough uh, discussion around what are safe parameters, what are things that you, know, you really shouldn't include people, uh, conditions you shouldn't include. Let's actually get that, let's get that um, defined. So they did. 1996, they met. Uh, Wasserman then in 98 published the first TMS risk and safety guidelines and it really kicked off um, a whole uh, timeline of safety meetings um, and governance that just still continues to, to today. Well, as I said, there's a tremendous amount of commercial stuff going on. There's a bunch of research stuff going on. People are generating coils like they are going out of business. I mean, there's um, at last count was something like 400 different coil types and shapes that are all considered tra transcranial magnetic stimulators, um, you know, of all different areas of complexity. And so things are going very, very fast, which is partly why Wasserman at all wanted to just, you know, kind of get their arms around the, the safety side of things. But um, because it's moving so fast and there's so much variety, it, it's, it's a tricky thing. So at the same time, again, um, so we're, we're at like late 90s here. Um, things are evolving. This Neurostar company had been in development for a while. They're using this a, fig, a figure eight coil. Um, and they were thinking, uh, based on some of the, the preliminary work, again, that it could be a, a really nice treatment for depression. So they are much more of a, cl a clinically focused company. So they decided to go after uh, FDA approval. As a, as a treatment for depression. Um, so in 2007, O'Riordan did this study which we'll look at um, using Neurostar system to go after depression. 2008, FDA approves it for major depressive disorder. Um, and then in 2010, NIMH goes back and completes the OPTMS trial um, to really try and solidify what's happening in the TMS world specifically for clinical use. So. Before we talk, we'll talk about Ariardin and, 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 and up TMS, but before we do that, we should talk about specifically what does the Neurostar system do. Neurostar is, um, was the first RTMS device. It's really a, it's a figure eight coil, so a lot of people call it a superficial TMS device. Um, and what they do is they, uh, in the original study, they looked at uh, doing these four second trains, so four seconds of stimulation um, at 10 hertz. So you get 40 stimuli delivered, and then you get to wait 26 seconds, and then you get 40 stimuli, 26 seconds for 40 stimuli, and that goes on. They do 75 trains total. So what you end up with is about 37 and a half minutes sitting getting treatment. Um, in that same study, they did 30 treatment sessions, so basically five times a week for six weeks. There's a bunch of other, um, other little settings where they sometimes they'll measure the total number of pulses delivered too. Um, it can be important, so they, they do 3,000 pulses total. Um, but if you could remember, basically what the, what the patients care about is four seconds, 26 seconds, four seconds, 26 seconds, because in the four seconds, um, they're experiencing the trains. Well, what does that mean? Well, it, they can feel it. You know, they can feel tingling in their scalp. They can feel um, discomfort, pain. It feels like there's a pretty strong tapping on your head. Um, there's a lot of nerves that run through your scalp. And so you can feel that those nerves are being stimulated in addition to all the other nerves. People will get facial twitching. Um, they'll get grimacing, they can get hand movement, arm movement, or again, remember your homunculus. If you're near a motor area, then you can be getting, um, you can be getting, um, experiencing all those things in addition to uh, what we're hoping it does for depression. Um, so 
the Neuronetics trial, they looked at about 300 subjects, um, and they found some really interesting things. Uh, it's industry, it was industry-sponsored study, so again, grain, uh, grain of salt with that. Um, but the, the big thing to look at is really the, they did the Madras, um, they did the Hamdi, uh, 24 and the 17. And um, when they looked at the response rates and the remission rates, they found significant differences at six weeks uh, in both response and remission. These are people that were washed out of their medications, too. So these are medication-free folks who have um, failed numerous medication trials. Their, um, their restriction for the study, I believe, was only one medication trial failure, but they said on average people had failed something like 15 medication trials. So it was a quite um, refractory depression population. And what they show is that um, in people that got active stimulation, 23.9% uh, made it to response, and 12.3% um, in the sham group. So there's, there's a, and that's statistically uh, significant. So there's quite a difference. Then remission rate, 14% of people will make it to remission, which is the matter score less than 10, and 5.5% of the sham group um, will, will also make it to, to remission. Now it's worth noting, Anytime you do a procedure and you're looking at sham versus active, the placebo effect um, is going to be pretty high. And here it's actually pretty low. Um, and some of the other studies we'll look at, it's higher. But, you know, anytime you engage intensely with an individual who's suffering, they're going to have some response. That's going to be a fact, an effect of that um, intense engagement. That's like some of the deep brain studies where they bring someone in, they open up their head, they wake them up in the operating room. I mean, if you didn't think that people were caring for you before, boy, they will now. You know, you're, you're doing things, right? So you just you really can't under, underestimate the impact of the placebo and all of this. It, it does. It does. Yeah, so the shams are really tricky, and they're hotly debated depending on what device you'll use, but um, in the Neurostar, there's actually um, a, 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 a pad that gets in the way of the magnetic field so that you'll still get seepage around it where you'll get superficial stimulation of the nerves, but you won't get a ton of cortex stimulated. That's hotly debated, though, by the different coil designers, right? Because then some of the other um, machines, you actually have... a totally different coil built in that only stimulates scalp that doesn't stimulate any of the, the brain structures. So what they found is that um, from uh, they'll ask people to, to try and say what group they were in, and they've not found significantly different um, results in those. So the shams are pretty darn good. Um, but again, placebo, you know, and again, for a, a clinical use too, we don't want to ignore placebo, right? Because it, it could be beneficial. It is beneficial all by itself. But again, industry sponsored, good size, yeah, okay rates. You know, these are these are okay in a really in a really resistant population getting a 23% response rate. Well, we'll take it. The next one was Mark George and his group um, through NIMH funded. Uh, they went after this uh, this OptMS study, N of 240. The the goal of this study was really to say, all right, this is the NIH gold standard study. This is going to prove once and for all, you know, get get rid of industry, let's make sure that this thing works and we'll all be happy. Well, they had a, this really complicated study design um, that didn't really match the Neuronetics trial all that well. And so the results, the outcomes, the rates, everybody was like, gosh, we just don't know exactly. You know, you use the same stimulation parameters, but instead of doing like six weeks of treatment, they did this three-week lead-in, then they did a three-week fixed treatment phase, and then a three-week extension. So it was, it's not really comparing apples to apples, which is unfortunate. Um, but what they did find is they found that in phase one, so the first treatment phase, they got 15% of people that with active TMS and 4% with sham to remit. Um, and it was a significant, to a significant level. But what was more interesting, I think, was they did this phase two open label crossover kind of thing where um, they basically just wanted to know if people got response in the first phase, or they were sham in the first phase, we want to give them a chance to get to six weeks of treatment or to get treatment at all. Um, so it was a bit of a modified crossover. And in that case, it was kind of exciting because they got 30% uh, follow-up remission rates, which is a pretty darn good number. You know, 43 out of 144 got to remission. And we remember, we were talking about remission being um, that, that, um, ma uh, that um, HAMD of less than 10. So it's a pretty high bar to get to complete remission, and they got 30%. TRD population, would you take 30% rate? Right? I, I would. I mean, that's, this is a pretty, pretty um, refractory population. 
So some really encouraging stuff happen, happening. We're at about 2010 here. Um, you know, FDA was already on board. Remember, we got FDA in 2008, so we're a couple of years into already FDA approval on the Neurostar device. Well, so what happens next? Well, there's a competitor that really starts um, coming on strong. Um, competition is good, but it's different. This is actually a, a DTMS device, so a deep TMS device. It's a different coil altogether um, intended to get deeper in the brain. And um, it started out at, at NIH, actually, in 1996. So uh, Bumi Zangan and Yiftak Roth, the two creators out at NIH, um, they developed the coil. NIH itself patents the coil in 2001. And then Brainsway comes along, which um, these guys were sort of founders of Brainsway, and licenses the coil exclusively. Um, and they continue doing work. So you have quite a bit of development work. And then from about 2003 to 2013, um, they are an Israeli company. So they were seeking a lot of CE approvals first, so the European um, agency's approvals. Uh, but then also in parallel, we're, we're going after FDA approval. And so then in 2013, this particular coil um, was also approved by the FDA. Now, what's the difference with deep TMS? So we talked about superficial TMS, and then we're talking about deep TMS. Well, superficial TMS, um, remember that we had four-second trains, 40 stimuli, 75 trains, 26 seconds in between. What do the patients care about? 37.5 minutes per session, 30 treatment sessions. I'm getting, um, I'm getting stimulated 75 times. Those are the three things they're going to care about, because that's what they're going to notice, right? Well, now with deep TMS, it's different. So they have two seconds trains with 36 stimuli for 55 trains. And what does that lead to? That leads to 20 minutes per session and a total of 20 treatment sessions. So as far as the patients are concerned, they kind of like this better because it's shorter and it's fewer um, taps to the head. And um, as far as the studies are concerned, what the clinicians care about is the outcomes were um, similar. And so when they went through, they did 212 patients, again, industry-sponsored study, um, so take that with a grain of salt. But they looked at remission and response rates at five weeks, and they found that in people that got active treatment, they got, it was 38.4% response, 21% in the sham, versus 32% remission and 14% in the sham. Um, now back to Dr. Nelson's question. This is using a completely different sham technique, um, because if you look, Instead of it just being a simple figure eight coil, what it is is it's actually a helmet that the, the, the patients wear. Um, and there's a sham, a separate sham coil actually built right into that helmet. So they're going to feel, everybody's going to feel the same thing. It's going to sound the same. Even the operators um, can't tell. And then actually in their system, they have a smart card based double blinding system. So no one knows um, until the blind is broken who got what, um, which is just pretty impressive. And it also sort of explains why some of their, um, their process has taken a little bit longer. Um, What's interesting, though, is a, lines are being drawn now, right? You have, like, two big vendors, each have FDA approval, and you just can't ignore the fact that that's going to impact who's getting what, who's choosing what. And if you, if you think about the implication of how the FDA labels things, FDA comes in and says, all right, well, you know, Neurostar, you have a couple of big studies. Brainsway, you got a big study. It all seems fine. We're just going to call these two things substantially equivalent. So those are the two words that FDA always uses. But does that mean they're the same? Of course not. There's just no way, you know. But as far as FDA is concerned, risks, um, impact, efficacy, they, they think that they're, they're, they're similar. Um, now, if you look, though, because Neurostar, again, this figure eight, superficial, um, you look at some of the, this is an fMRI of, of what sort of stimulation people are going to get, and red is increased stimulation versus the deep TMS where you're getting a lot deeper um, and you're actually getting bilateral, bifrontal stimulation. They're different. And the question, the giant question, is which one is better? Well, there's no data yet. There really just isn't. No one's done the big head-to-head -head as of yet. Uh, and according to FDA, we're substantially equivalent. The thing that is the same, though, is really the clinical side of things. MDD recurrence or VR. That's the only thing it's labeled for, either one. Doesn't matter which call you pick. Multiple medication or failures are a requirement. Again, doesn't matter which call you pick. No psychosis, no seizure disorder, no acute suicidal ideation. That gets you to either one of these devices. And then really, um, you know, the, it's, it's in the subtleties which device you choose. Both devices are very expensive. So you often have to decide. You usually can't just say, well, I have one of each, and we'll just use them, and that'll be okay. That doesn't fly most places. 
Now, this substantially equivalent phrase is getting more difficult, too, because actually as of this last month, MagStim, which is another vendor that's been around in research, has just been FDA approved as well. And then MagVenture, another group that's been really into MRI, TMS, um, they'll likely be approved sometime this summer. So it's getting more complicated, not less, and needing uh, more information, not less. Oh, uh, TRD. They're, they're labeled exactly the same as the, um, as the other two. Yeah. So again, they're just, they're just they're follow on, substantially equivalent, you know, same treatment parameters um, as the neural star, because these are both figure eight uh, coils. So all, taking all of that into account, it, you come down to like, well, what, what actually happens in the real world? And Linda Carpenter out at Brown um, has done an amazing job trying to really break apart um, how do people do long term? So they, they ran 307 people across like 25 different sites and said, how do people actually do? Um, we're going to just have it be open. We're going to um, look at people that are actually on medications because the other people in the other studies were not medicated and when does that really happen? Um, and so what they found is that actually if you leave people on their meds and you look at them in a real clinic, you find that you can get 58% of people um, response and 37% into remission, which is pretty amazing. Um, and if you look at low treatment resistance versus high, you know, they're fairly comparable, but the people with low treatment resistance, well, they do better. Mm, it kind of makes sense, you know, even though you're not really going to be targeting them, um, uh, you'll have to try other therapies first. Um, and it kind of follows with the IDD, IDSSR and the PHQ-9 outcomes. Well, then Dunner, another, he was uh, part of the, the Linda's group, um, he went and he looked to see what kind of maintenance effect could you get because the question is, well, sure, it maybe works in the near term, but does it last? Well, it seems to last, actually. So they looked at um, 257 patients. Out of those folks, out of the 257, they saw that 120 out of 257 met either response or remission criteria, which fits with Linda's paper. Um, but then when they looked out to 12 months, 62.5% continued to meet at least response at one year. So there is some sort of durability um, of effect. And um, it's not exactly clear what's going to determine whether someone's going to have a durable effect, but it, um, it, it, it is there. So, DTMS arrived. Dr. Jasberg, this is a, Dr. Jasberg, not one of our patients, um, but it's a great picture. It has to be in every, every talk we give. <laughs> um, so DTMS is in Minnesota now because we had to decide. We had to decide whether we we're gonna do Neurostar or Brainsway, and again, you just like, we like the 20 minutes, 20 treatments. Um, and that, you know, th that brain sway wasn't in, in the cities here yet. So um, that's what we started with. We really started uh, down at the VA, and Div Bick and Greg, Dr. Lim, got a, a research device, which is really exciting. And then shortly thereafter, we got a clinical device out, at, out in St. Louis Park. Um, device is installed, the operators are trained, clinical programs initiated, and three patients have been treated. And we'll talk through how those three patients are doing. And as you can see, people are very, very happy when they're sitting in the stimulator. <laughs> so, and when they're providing stimulation, you know. So it's, it's great. So just to review criteria for treatment, because I think this is, this is really important. 29623, 29633. MDD recurrent severe without psychotic behavior. It's not labeled for anything else. And so that's all, we're, that's all we do. Um, other places doing other things, yes. There's a tremendous variability in the community, but we want to stick very closely to the labeling. Uh, so they kind of break out. These are the Medicare rules here. They want a lack of cl clinical response to four trials of medications, two from different classes. And if you don't tolerate four agents, so let's say you don't get a full trial, but you have intolerance with distinct and documented side effects, that counts as well. Um, if you also were to have a, instead of, so these are ORs here, or you don't tolerate, or you have a documented response to TMS in the past, which one of our patients had TMS in the past, responded, and so we treated her, and she responded again. That gets you in. Or if you've responded to ECT in the past, but you're unable to tolerate, um, and TMS is considered less invasive, which we think it is, then you, you qualify. Now the and, the and to any of these ORs is that you must have a trial of evidence-based psychotherapy with adequate frequency and duration and without significant improvement. And that's really important that you must have that. Um, and we encourage actually people to have uh, ongoing psychotherapy while they're in the TMS treatment too because it's, it's vital. Um, and the data are starting to finally come on board to, to support that. So what things do we screen for? Um, we screen for standard things. 
uh, as dictated by the manufacturer and the payers. Um, again, this is, this is more restrictive than a lot of community providers, especially out on the East Coast. Um, and it's kind of scary, so we want to stay to the really, really careful. No seizure disorders, no history of seizure, except for, you know, a kid has febrile seizure that we don't, we don't consider that a seizure disorder. Vagus nerve stimulators, you know, leads up in the carotid sheath, we're not going to take you. Uh, any implanted medical devices located within 30 centimeters of the magnetic coil. Right now, we're just steering clear of, of devices altogether because it's just, um, it's just really uncertain. Um, the, the exclusions, absolute exclusion, psychosis, or no, no, active suicidal ideation, not going to do it. Um, and then other neurological, severe neurological conditions. Um, let's see, read there. And then the big thing is if you have something metal in you, you were a, a welder for a lot of years and you have metal in your eyes, you have like plate in your head, you know, any of that stuff, we're just, we're just not willing to take that risk. So how does treatment work? Well, people get referred by their primary psychiatrist to the St. Louis Park location. They get an eval by um, currently Dr. Jasper or myself starting July 6th. Um, and then we go after prior authorization if they're not Medicare. And we'll talk about that. That's pretty rough right now, but we're, we're working on it. Um, and then it, let's say they're Medicare. They're approved right from the get-go. We think they're in good shape. Then we start the treatments. The treatments, again, four weeks, five days a week. Um, most of the days are just standard treatment. 20 minutes, they're in, they're out usually by 30 minutes. Um, but on Mondays, we do this motor mapping. Remember way, way back where we want to go for APB. We want to get a twitch. But what we do on that first day is we figure out where their motor cortex is located and we figure out how much energy does it take to get a twitch out of that cortex. And then we dial down the machine as low as we can go. That's their motor threshold. That tells us how much energy they're going to be safe to use uh, in the treatment. And then we will use that location to actually move the coil to go after the location we think is responsible for their depression. So that happens, oops, that happens on the, on the, first, uh, on the first week and doesn't get done again. But what gets done every, six, um, uh, every successive Monday then is we, we just check, check to make sure that the energy required for their motor, their motor twitch hasn't changed. Because frequently, up to 20% um, of people, it'll go down by up to 20%. So you're actually going to increase some of their risks for the treatment. Well, what are the big risks that we worry about? Seizure. Seizure is the one big side effect that we have to talk to everybody about because you're putting energy in their brain. There's a good chance that you can trigger something, right? Whether it's a muscle twitch or in a rare event, somewhere between 1 in 3,000 and 1 in 30,000, you can trigger a full generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And we don't want that when people aren't under anesthesia. ECT, it's fine. TMS, very bad. Um, in the pivotal studies, there was only one seizure reported. So it's, it's pretty darn rare. But we want to be careful. So we're screening for how much sleep are they getting? Are they on any other medications that could re lower their seizure threshold? Did they drink a half a bottle of wine the night before as the person did in the pivotal brain sway study that had a seizure? Um, we're doing all of those things every day we're checking, but then every single week we're also just checking what is their resting motor threshold in their brain just to make sure that it hasn't taken a big dive and that we're at risk now. Okay, so that's kind of the general treatment. Um, people go through all four weeks. Usually they'll have a little bit of the extra, um, a little headache, a little bit of uh, tingling in their scalp, sometimes a little sensitivity. Usually right through here, um, because what's happening is we do their motor threshold and then they get a treatment. And then the next day, we, we increase the level of energy by 10%. And then the third day, we increase by another 10%. And so what we do is we decide what their energy should be, and then we get them up to 120% of that energy requirement. So we're putting more energy in, so their side effects can be a little bit stronger. Um, but again, because we're using their, their motor threshold, it's still tailored to their particular brain. Well, how do people do? Well, this is patient one. He was a 69-year-old male with a uh, diagnosis of MBD, recurrent severe. He was recently started on Marplan um, and had been on for maybe, oh, I don't know, a month or so. And his PHQ-9 actually had been like way up here um, and then came down on the Marplan. But when we saw him, his madras was still at 22, so still pretty darn high. Um, he started treatments and was really getting into the swing of things, was tolerating them well. Um, he had a little bit of hand movement, but um, not too much discomfort. And then right around here, he started having really low blood pressures again, which he had had some transient low blood pressures when he had first gotten going on the MAR plan. Uh, but they, they were really becoming bothersome. They seemed to be exertional. So we said, you know what? We're just going to stop. This is just, we don't know what's coming from. Is it the MAR plan? Is it the TMS? We don't know. Let's just, let's just stop. 
you can always come back and, and, and get back into the treatment once this all gets ironed out. So we're waiting to hear um, if sort of where, where things are at. Um, but again, as you can see, we got him from a 22 all the way down to 11 before we had to, had to stop his treatment. Even though he kind of took a little dip on his PHQ-9, you know, he was kind of starting low, so he didn't, he didn't go very far. Next patient, 66-year-old female. Um, pre recent trial of velazidone, didn't tolerate that, was started on nortriptyline now oh, maybe a week before treatment, just low-dose nortriptyline. Um, again, she, um, these are the 0 to 12, these are just measurements of the location where we're stimulating and how much energy we were using for resting motor threshold. I, it's important to include it so people know what kind of energies we're talking about. Um, but when we started, she was having like hands, she was having upper arm, and she was having leg movements. I mean, she's like dancing around, which those are all really, really bad. You can have a little bit of hand, you can have face. Anything more than that, you gotta, you gotta move the, the coil around. So we had to move the coil around, we had to like ease her into 120%, but once we got her there, all of that settled, settled down. She was tolerating it well. Um, and what was interesting is she came in um, kind of, you know, bouncing around on her PHK9, came in you know, pretty high, actually. Um, big self-perceived level of distress. Madras was really high. And after 19 treatments, so she had one treatment to go, she decided to stop because she didn't perceive any benefit to the treatment. Which is really interesting uh, because we saw her go from 33 to 20, which... I, that's something. Um, and she had dips where she was, was improving on her PHQ-9, but she wasn't driving prior to treatment, and she was driving again. And she was like sitting in the treatment chair, reading her cell phone, or working on her, you know, watch, looking at kids of her grandkids, listening to music, kind of bouncing around. So this, this question of self-report versus what we're seeing versus what's structured versus just unstructured observation, they, they don't all go together. And so you know, this patient has really encouraged us to think about what sort of assessments are we using in order to see if, if people are, are really getting better or not. And then patient number three is our just like, yes, how does she? Her goal was that. Yeah, so just for people who can't hear, Dr. Olson was saying, or anybody online, um, he saw the patient yesterday, and they agreed not to, to pursue ECT. She had done ECT in the past and had been talking throughout all of our treatments about, well, maybe I should do ECT instead. Uh, but her goal in the beginning was a mir miraculous resolution of symptoms through ECT, which it sounds like she's now come to current terms with that. Okay, so therapeutic nortriptyline and lithium augmentation. Let's see how she's doing. She's still driving? Yep, still driving. So that's, that's, that's something, you know. Um, patient three, though, so vegetative depression. A uh, 10 second delay in response when asking questions at her, her evaluation. Really, um, no, no concomitant anything. Um, has a long history of cyclical depression. This episode was quite um, protracted and had been going on for at least nine to, to 12 months. I uh, had been on everything under the sun, including doing a trial of ketamine over at another institution, um, and then also got nine treatments of ECT with, with pretty profound side effects. So we got her, uh, did an eval. She, she, I mean, the 10 second delay was, was real. I was constantly, because I, jibber jabber too fast and too frequently, stepping on her words. I mean, it was just, it was so hard. <laughs> the interview took forever. Um, and so we got her in, and so she started at a 28 on the Madras, and we got her down to a five. Um, and she started at a 15 on the PHQ-9 and ended up down here at, at, at about a six or a seven. Um, throughout the whole time, she told us, she's like, well, I can't tell. I can't tell about my depression. I know I'm depressed, but I can't really tell you about it. And once I'm not depressed, I can't remember what it was like to be depressed. Um, and so it was fascinating to see her get better because she was tremendously better. She was bubbly, bright, smiling. She was going up and going, working at the cabin. Her family members were like, oh my gosh, this is a different, this is a different person. Um, we, she was also on velazidone. We left her stable on the velazidone because we know there's enough data to suggest that medication seems to help. Um, so she's really, uh, it was, she was, delightful to work with it and, and really ended up at a, at a really nice place. And I think the, the last day of treatment, she was headed off to the cabin again to, to work on the yard and do stuff again. So it was, it was really fun to see. So 
Um, just a quick note on the referral process. We've gotten a bazillion referrals, which is great, but we've also had to refactor our, our process a little bit because it's like this much paperwork. Um, so what we have is we have a, a referral form. We request that it come from the primary mental health provider. Um, they should indicate whether they're interested in hearing back for when the patient's scheduled. We've gotten feedback that some providers don't care if the patient, when they, they get scheduled, some want to know right away. So we'll ask you to indicate that. Um, you just send the referral to St. Louis Park via fax, and all these instructions are actually on the referral form as well. Um, and then they'll get them scheduled for an eval with, with one of us. Um, so insurance coverage, it's terrible. It's just Medicare right now. Everybody else is fighting it. Um, it's covered all over the East Coast. So, and all over like Nebraska and some of the, the southern states. So we're gonna, we're gonna work hard on that. Um, and then the final thing is just next steps. We really need to get some, some more information around how people are actually doing. And so we're gonna, we're gonna add in some activity tracking because um, a lot of the research has reported that people start to get activated and sleeping better and doing more things day to day. And so we wanna just see if we get their, their steps up. This, who knows, maybe we will. Um, and then the other thing is while they're actually getting TMS right now, our, our wonderful operators um, are just great at sitting and, and chatting with the person. It's like sort of supportive psychotherapy, uh, but we'd like to kind of formalize that a little bit. So we have some ideas, maybe do some tasks, uh, try this thing called life moves, which is kind of a, a really wacky um, way of, of doing sort of facial interaction and, and coordinated hand movements, uh, guided meditation. Some people are playing Delta to Gamma music, so all the different um, levels of EEG, they actually have music that are, are written into those ranges. So some people listen to that. Um, and then psychotherapy, potentially. Um, so acknowledgements, you know, a ton of people have worked on this, um, and I really, really appreciate everything everybody's done. Um, you know, it it's, takes a village to raise a new program, so um, I appreciate it. And uh, uh, questions? Yeah, so the question was, um, will we ask her to come back in a year? So I'll, I'll actually see her in two weeks, and then she's gonna, she's without an individual psychiatrist right now, so she's gonna actually stay on with me um, for med management. Is that a plan for, for specific Not usually. Yeah, no, um, typically this, she's sort of unusual. Most people will go back to their primary psychiatrist, but what we, what we need to do is figure out as a community how we could connect everybody together so that we can get follow-up um, information. Just following up on that point, it is what's our what's your thinking in terms of issues around maintenance? Because this yeah. last patient had has, as you said, cyclical recurrent depressions, and yeah. so what's the thinking about yeah. that? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and it's a question the literature is really struggling with. People are showing that maintenance is effective. It is not at all approved, and it's not paid for. Um, so the data is evolving. What the way uh, Medicare has come down in a lot of the payers on the East Coast is that you have to wait for people to relapse which is a bummer. But um, Linda Carpenter out at Brown, so they've run you know, thousands and thousands of patients through TMS, and they say that um, as people get subsequent treatments, that clinically they've noticed that the time in between relapses stretches out, and that people seem to perk up a lot faster than when they get repeat treatments. So there may be a kind of a nice evolving story there. They're trying to get some data around that. My question kind of dovetails onto Kelvin's. How convinced are you of the four or six week dose size, and how was that arrived at? Yeah, um, so I'm convinced that everybody probably needs like five to six weeks of treatment. You know, four is probably not gonna be enough, I think, with the brain sway, um, and that's actually echoed by Brown and how they've, um, uh, and how some of the national plans are, are writing their policies. From an actual data perspective, um, you know, the pivotal study for brain sway, they, stopped, they, they measured people at, at the beginning of week five, but they actually went into maintenance treatment and ran people out to six weeks with three times a week treatment. And then they actually did a post-marketing study that I don't think is in the literature yet, but that they, they sent me where they find that if they do a full six weeks of treatment, their um, response and remission rates go up quite substantially. So what's a uh, nice thing is Medicare covers up to 30 treatments. We only sort of need 20 for a course of treatment. But for certain folks, if we don't feel like they, if we feel like they've perked up some, but they're not all the way there yet, we could technically stretch it out to 30. Thank you. This was great. I'm just wondering if you can speak to how you guys evaluate the previous psychotherapy experience and for these three patients. What yeah. It's a great question. Um, right now, it's just sort of gestalt <laughs> Like. 
have, the, have you actually done psychotherapy? And then we asked them at length, like, who was it with? What did you guys do? Was it CBT? Was it supportive? Because probably, and this is um, being tested right now in the literature, it's probably CBT that's going to be the most effective to combine with TMS. And so if we get somebody that's like, oh, I did CBT before, we're like, ooh, sweet, great, okay. We need to get you back into CBT as soon as possible while we're doing treatment. Um, and some people are actually trying CBT in the chair, which is, which is kind of neat. So I guess my question, what is the cost of 20 sessions? So it depends on the payers, right? On average, it's somewhere between seven and $10,000 for the full course of treatment. Um, if you go into the community and you pay out of pocket, it's generally more like $15,000. Um, but it depends on the payer, so Medicare pays a little bit less. MA pays, like on the East Coast, I think they pay like $26 a treatment or something like that. So it ends up being, I think like $1,000 or, but it, 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 it all depends on negotiation. Let's just end on one more comment from Dr. Schultz, and then we have residency training committee after that. So um, I really want to thank you very much for just an outstanding presentation of this. And what I want to let uh, the audience know is that in addition to setting up this uh, TMS, this is part of the university's neuromodulation program. I think you even won uh, the fellowship. Uh, this last year, which was uh, really outstanding. The neuromodulation program is really all around all the neuroscience centers. So if people have ideas of things they might want to look at with a collaboration, say with neurology, et cetera. Yep. Uh, so for even as an example, there will be a new research program. Katie, I think you won a grant from the neuromodulation program. Uh, and so did Dr. Steve Haynes. And mm -hmm. uh, he was looking at TMS and a really interesting area of facial pain uh, rather than having surgery. So this is a, a, a much broader program and a moderate amount of support from the state legislature and the med school. So congratulations on your fellowship and thanks Thank very much for your talk. Thanks, Dr. Schultz. <clears throat>